Welcome again, saints. It is I, your dearest, dearest servant, uh, Pastor Dale from St. Mark Baptist Church in Waterloo, Iowa. Hey, before we do any other thing, let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you again for bringing us, uh, Lord, through another series of lessons, Lord, uh, into uh, this winter series of lessons here. Lord, I just thank you uh, for Dr. Young, uh, the, the convention president. Lord, I, I certainly thank you for the writer. Uh, Dr. Javon uh, Marshall, Lord, who, Lord, you have given him a gift, uh, Lord, and I, I just, I, I praise you for that, and I praise you that uh, not only I, but tens of thousands of Sunday school students as well uh, across the country, Lord, around the world, Lord, can just be blessed by the gifts you've given him. Lord, I ask that you open our eyes and ears in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, saints, before we get started, just a couple of things uh, is I want you to go down right now and hit that subscribe button. I want you to share this video uh, as well if it uh, blesses you. And also, uh, and as always, down in the description section, and you can certainly uh, see into the mind of God through uh, high level, Holy Ghost filled uh, deeper mysteries of God, pastoral sermon notes. I want you to go down as well and visit sermondownload.net. That is your dearest servant's website. And I want you to see into the mind of God, how he deals with us who buy books and literature and all of these other things, devotionals, uh, Sunday school books. I want you to take just another step uh, with us so you can see how God deals with his message. Go to sermondownloads.net. I download the package that's right for you. We begin lesson one today, so there's no review. December 4, 2022, unit one, God prepares the way, a special promise. The devotional reading is John 10, 22 through 30. And background scriptures, Luke 1, 5 through 23. In the print passage, Luke 1, 8 uh, through 20. And the key verse, the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son and shall call his name John. And the lesson aims today as a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do these things. Understand the, the pronouncement of John's birth in the context of coming Messiah. Examine Zacharias' mixed emotions and identify with his feelings. Wait expectantly on God, confident uh, that he answers prayer. And uh, since today, as we move into this, I'm trying to get this lesson down um, to 30, uh, certainly 30 minutes. So we're going to take going forward anyway. We're going to take some very, very big picture uh, views of this lesson, because here's the thing. You could so some of you, so a few of you soldier on to the end of a 35 or 40 minute lesson, but most of you bounce out at about the 18, 20 minute mark. And uh, it, there is a way for me to become a Jew to a Jew, Greek to a Greek, free, free, bond, bond, as Paul taught us. So uh, going forward, I'm going to take some very big picture views. And also, I'm also going to put up a Sunday School Lesson overview each week as well, given huge ideas in nine minutes, 59 seconds or less. And as always, saints, before I get to the introduction here, um, anything that I say, any video, any points, you're welcome to take notes, reteach them, pre re preach them, what, what, you know, whatever you want to do. And I'm not like saying God doesn't give you a word. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that this stuff is copyright free, right? What, what I give you is copyright free. I can't say that necessarily for the Sunday school lesson, but I can tell you that whatever you want to use, please feel free, uh, to use it without crediting the author, unless the author, unless you credit the Holy Ghost, right? Introduction. Most adults have lived long enough to recall the memory of someone's broken promise to them. One of the biggest reasons why people break promises is that despite the sincerest intention, they're simply unable to deliver or come through with that which was promised. Oh, I read that before too. That, that was in another lesson as well, and it's still true. Perhaps someone in your life promised a certain toy, gift, service, or outing or failed to deliver due to disregard or circumstances beyond their control. Yeah, this was like the opening for another one. Illness in the family, a scheduled interruption, a sudden loss of financial resources that made the promise unaffordable. The more broken promises you endure, the more cynical and distrusting he or she becomes. Uh, the world often raises personal expectations and drop them suddenly. And one of those, as, as we go down to the analysis of the biblical text today, keep it in mind, our lesson is a special promise today, is uh, President Joe Biden promised to re uh, erase up to $20,000 in student debt, right? People, if you got a Pell Grant, you up to 20. And if you didn't get a Pell Grant, which means you, your family's per, you know middle class, upper middle class, well off probably. In the scheme of things, anyway, that doesn't say rich, but you get up to 10,000. 
uh, and, and those Republicans came in. Not that I'm saying Republicans or Democrats are different. And now they challenged it in court and who knows if it's going to happen now. So I got the email. I'm signed up for, you know, I'm signed up for that. I got the email. I'm like, oh man, just dropped us like some hot rocks. But that is true. And a lot of times before I go to the analysis of the biblical text, saints, people can't keep promises. And what I have found, the Bible, God's word said, it is better to not vow a vow than to vow that vow and break it. And the Bible goes on to say, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. So I have found out a few things. Um, and the mother in our church, uh, I won't say her name. <laughs> She's like the city's mother. Um, we bless because, you know, a lot of times uh, in our churches, there's a they're like this super deacon that everybody looks to. And then there's a super mother that everybody looks to. And they may not be in the same church. Uh, I, I'm blessed in this season to have our city's mother uh, in our church, uh, right? Our, our, we call our city's church mother. She said something to me, and I, I, I will not forget it when I began pastoring. And Mother she said, she said, Pastor, you know, my first time pastor, you really, she said, I know you want to do stuff, but what you need to say is if the Lord wills that you will do it. And I say that because we make promises, and a lot of times those promises may not be according to God's will, but we've already made the promises, and when those promises are broken, whatever the reason. A lie is a lie. That's just how it is. A lie is a lie. I didn't mean to. I forgot or something else more important came up. If we make a promise, we're obligated to deliver on that promise, right? So mother told me that. And now I added, because I live out in the boondocks, right? And if the creeks and the rivers rise, like where I live, I literally can't get to where I pastor at, you know, some 40 miles away is where I pastor at from where I live. And a lot, and, and we make these promises and then we're unable to keep them. And what I want to say before going to the analysis of the biblical text today, saints, is broken promises leave lifelong damage. Whether you meant them or not, they leave lifelong damage. And for instance, when I was a boy, and I ended up in foster care and some other things, uh, adopted. Uh, abandoned by my mother and father. And, but even when I, even after adoption, I, you know, our foster mother who became my, she's my mama. I don't mean to use foster because she raised me from the age of nine, eight, uh, to grown and, and loved me and believed in me, right? I'm not sitting here. Um, if she wouldn't even introduce me to the Lord, took, dragged me to church, dragged me and my siblings to church where I first heard the name of Jesus in 1980, right? So I, I'm seeing this to point out is that he, bro he broke promises and after a while, I knew I couldn't depend on him. Now, I failed as a father as well. I failed as a father and a grandfather. I'm not like pointing fingers. Y'all know I don't try to soften the blow, but it's apropos this time. So we break promises and then we turn around and break promises to others. And what we have to understand is we can add if the Lord wills, but we need to pray and seek God's guidance even with what we promise. And if we can't promise, say, hey, I'm not going to promise I can do that. And I see that because a lot of times we become people pleasers and in becoming people pleasers, we turn into liars. If you follow me here, right? We want to please people. We even want to do ministry. But at the end of the day, we end up hurting someone. We end up hurting the cause of Christ and all these things because we can't keep promises. One of the big things in the church is that a lot of times uh, a, a leader promises to do something or some people promise to do something. It doesn't get done for whatever reason. And people leave the church discouraged and they never return. Right? So we need to be prayerful about that. The analysis of the biblical text, Luke 8, uh, 1, 8 through 11. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office, Zechariah, before God, in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there... Were, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, Zechariah, the description was busy fulfilling his duty in the temple as a sign. Notice his faithfulness in performing this task. God calls us to faithfulness and diligence in our work for the kingdom of God to accomplish whatever assignment we are giving for his glory. Zechariah's course of division, family religious, was on call to serve the, within that grouping. Zechariah had been chosen by Lot. 
to burn temple incense. The temple was a place where God had made his presence known to his people throughout their history. Now, I'm going to stop right there and tell you that, remember, like we, like the temple of the Lord now was within us. So the altars that are in the temple that we are supposed to bring our sacrifice to are now within us. We don't need to, as Moses, kick off our, sh have to go to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, wherever that mountain of God is. And kick off our sandals because the place we stand is holy ground. Any place you stand because God, because the temple of God and the holy of holies now, the God's Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit rests with us. Any place you stand, saints. Welcome again, saints. It is your dearest servant, brother, Pastor Brian Dale. I am asking you right now to go to the description section of this video and click the link for sermondownload.net. We want you to take the next step. We buy, you buy devotionals, you buy Bible studies, you buy books uh, from religious leaders, all of these things. We want you to go straight to the source, into the mind of God, which are pastoral sermon notes. That's where these things originate at. So you can see straight into the process and how God deals with us as we deliver our word. These are good for Sunday morning preaching. All you can do is just print and preach. They're ready to go. You can pull them up on any device, smartphone, all the way up to your tablet devices. You can also use them as Bible study content as well. Further, if you lean into that a bit further, we have a 104 sermon package where you can download 104 sermons and saints you could turn this into books devotionals our notes are thorough they're doctrinal they're theological we want you to go to sermondownload.net by clicking in the link the description section of this video so be it is holy ground so our temples are here and that's why you hear people saying cleanse the temple be careful what you put into the temple and those types of things because this is now uh, the temple. And as I continue here, when the time came for burning uh, of incense, the symbol of prayers rising to God, the people came together for corporate prayer. As the priest stood serving inside the temple, the people remained outside praying. Imagine the power and impact the church could experience if worshipers were diligent in their duty to serve and to pray. I would say, I would say further than this, if we were diligent in our duties, this nation would be a different place. I'm not saying totally different place. The church is not called to save the entire world. Only Jesus, when he comes back, is going to change this thing. And even then, the whole world is not going to be saved because we know that there are people that are going to uh, be burning and screaming alive in hell and in the lake of fire. So don't think ever that I'm suggesting that our job as the church, our Jesus called us to go into the world to save the entire world. Uh -uh. When Jesus said, go into all the world, preach to God, so baptizing him on and on, we have to put that together with John 3, 16. So we got to put those verses in Matthew chap, uh, chapter 28. So we put Matthew 28 with John chapter three. And Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It never said everybody would. So going to all the world, preaching the gospel to all nations and baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and all those. It says, it didn't say though, it said with that whosoever clause, there realizes Jesus realized Jesus is God in the flesh. Beginning in, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, right? We realize that everybody's not going to accept Jesus. So when we go out, we're to pick the fruit that he would have. But I would tell you this, we are, we've left so much fruit in the vineyard that that fruit has gotten rotten, dropped to the ground and died. We have, because the Bible says, uh, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Imagine. Imagine having eight apple trees and they just produce beautiful apples. You got a little apple orchard going on. They produce beautiful apples. And you, and, and for years, you went out, you and your family, you went out and picked it. You canned them. You made applesauce. You did all of these things. Uh, my mother used to make this apple butter. Oh my gosh. Oh man, Mother Smith, straight out of Mississippi, man. She, oh, it was amazing. She was amazing. Any, oh, sorry, I got sidetracked. But, Nevertheless, but imagine one year you went out and there was a bunch of apples and because you didn't have anyone to help you, you couldn't pick all the apples. So you picked all the apples you could and you knew I had to get them canned and all this stuff within a certain amount of time or even the ones I picked would go rotten. And you know that you're going to leave fruit on there and a lot of that fruit's going to drop and die, go to the ground because nobody picked that fruit. The same is true, saints, in the kingdom of God with respect to our subjects. Again, when we talk about going into the world, man, we're to pick all the fruit that we can. But that doesn't mean that all the fruit will be picked. But what I'm saying is there is even fruit that we are supposed to pick. 
that dry, dies and drops to the ground because we're not diligent in the task that God has called us to. What do you think? Why is it particularly important for believers to know and remember that God is mindful of every act of service we offer in his name, even the task of going notice to others? It's important, uh, Saint, that because God is, the Bible talks about the God being a rewarder of them that diligently seek them. And we have to remember because we forget things and we break promises. That doesn't mean God forgets things and that he's going to break his promise to us for being faithful to him. The Bible tells us, those that endure to the end, them shall be saved. And the Bible also talks about, you know, there's a saying, if you don't have a cross crown, the Bible talks about uh, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. That's one of those prom promises that God is mindful of every act of service that we give in his name. And yeah, we're going to be rewarded. But saints, if you think about it, we've already been rewarded. I didn't know. I had for, for years, my mama and the old mothers in the church, and, and they, they would say things, and, and the preacher would say things, that if God don't ever do another thing, he's done enough. And there's a gospel song that the Lord never does anything else for me, he's done enough. Because again, when you think about it, we're going to get further rewards for serving God. But what could be bigger, saints, than eternal life? He's not going to forget, I heard a song say, God has not forgot. God has not forgot. Destiny, Luke uh, 1, 12 through 16. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell on him. But the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for your prayers heard. And your wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and shall call his name John. And you shall have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall shall be shall he turn to the Lord their God. And the description says, the Bible does not specify exactly when Zechariah noticed the angel's presence. One thing is clear: Zechariah was troubled, and and this and filled with fear when he saw the angel. Now I want to stop there as well. Is that I know you've been taught that fear is wrong. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. Again, you know, one thing that I do here on this channel is I destroy false doctrine. People taught you that fear is wrong. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Now, there is a sort of fear that's wrong, and that's the fear. The Bible talks about God doesn't give us the spirit of fear but a sound mind is into all the saints. Now that's the worldly kind of fear where you're fearing losing something or you're jealous. That's a worldly kind of fear that the Bible says it tortures us basically. But when we talk about the fear of the Lord, that kind of fear actually produces a sound mind is into all the saints. So when we look at those two, there's a worldly kind of fear that produces torture uh, and, and pulls us away from God. But then even within that, part of having a sound mind is having a healthy fear, which is the fear of the Lord, right? So that's that's a beautiful thing. Who told him to fear not? Now, the angel told him, don't fear, right? But Zacharias understood what when he saw this angel, he understood that the Lord must have sent this angel. So he had the fear of the Lord, but the angel comforted him. So that's, I want to make that clear because people are teaching that like Zechariah was wrong for having fear. And that's not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That doesn't mean that an angel can't come and say, man, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You know, it's okay. Because again, when I was, uh, when I served in the Marine Corps, um, we just, we were enlisted. You know, I was an NCO. And, but when, when officers came in, what we would have to do when the officer entered our space is we'd have to get up wherever we were, whether at dinner, bathroom, we could be washing our face, we could be shaving, we could be anywhere, right? And if an officer came in, attention on that, pow, you'd have to get up. Because in a part of you, you know, part of you kind of just start trembling because this is an officer. You don't know what they're there for. They got high rank to you. They could send you to prison even if they wanted to. So it's, and they, they would say something to comfort us. They would say, at ease or as you were. And it, it would let us know, don't, don't be afraid. It's okay. And that's what this angel did on a much higher scale. He was telling them, you're giving honor and fear and reverence to what is due reverence, but it's okay. So I, I want to 
explain that to you. What do you think? What steps can modern believers take to help others, especially their children, to discern and pursue their destiny as revealed to us by God, especially children? Here's what I want to tell you about our children. And I say, ah, I got two long kids, too, and I got a granddaughter. One thing that we can do is to stop believing that we know it's best for them when they get to a certain age. I feel so bad for so many of our young African-American kids when I know that their parents are forcing them into situations, trying to live vicariously through them. A lot of times we say, I want my kids to have things that I didn't have. And I get that. I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to build, you know, generational wealth. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when that becomes wrong is when we want for them something that God does not want for them. Does that make sense? And I know you think you know your child better than everybody else, but you don't. My children, I, they're grown and I am still finding out things about them that I have no idea. Some of them I, you know, applaud and others I'm like, how is that possible? Right? So I'm saying what I'm saying here is the best thing you can do to help your children pursue their destiny is to release them into God's hands to do so. I was, I want to also say this about our in our European view of how family units should function. We have a uh, deacon at our church and um, for a long time in my spirit, not verbally, not because I wasn't afraid, but because I know this guy is full of grace. He's just, I am challenged by no preacher ever, pastor ever, has challenged me in the area of grace as watching this guy. He's full of grace. And he believes in taking care of his family, and that includes his grown kids. And for a long time in my spirit, I was like, and I even mentioned, I said, you know, don't you think this is enabling him? And he said, man, it's my family. I'm going to take care of my family. And I, and I was like, okay. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't, I think he's hurting them, not helping them. But he, when I read God's word, I find some, this big idea out that multi generations of families biblically lived with and dwelled with one another. You don't believe me? Why don't you read the story of Abraham? So I said that to point out is that when we're talking about even understanding how we should even deal with our children and approach them. We need to be open to the reality that this thing, we got to throw kids out of the nest and we never have to do anything else for them unless they force us to. Like y'all have been there. I ain't giving they grown. They got to get a job. Yeah, you say that. <laughs> I said that. And then they, they show up. Y'all seen them, right? No matter if they work and they doing well, y'all show or, or the grandkids need something. Y'all seen this? I call them the puppy dog eyes. So y'all seen grown kids with the puppy dog eyes, right? But what I found out is when we remove that kind of even that European view of how families should operate, there's a matriarch and a patriarch in families that take care of their kids and then their kids' kids, and they all pull resources together. And I had to repent before the Lord for my view of my what my brother was doing because he actually had the biblical way. And I'm thinking in this Greco Western European thing that says you got to throw kids out and you got to throw them into the deep end where they always got to be able to trend. Should kids be self sufficient? Yes. But at the same time, whether it is emotionally, spiritually, and even sometimes physically, we have an obligation to care for our children and then their children. And in turn, they are going to care for us. That's how this thing works. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain asked God. Yes, you are. Amen. And then the description, and we're almost done here. As the angel continued talking, Zechariah had not been able to speak a single word. The angel continued to speak of John's destiny, celebrating on the work that God would do through him. John will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and his ministry will resemble that of a prophet Elijah's spirit of power. The soundness of John's message would resonate in such a way that pricked the ears and the hearts of people, making them ready to receive the Lord. The angel's message was sound and concise. There was no room or reason to question what he had said. However, Zechariah questioned the entirety of the message based on his own limited understanding and perception. You remember Elizabeth. This was Mary's cousin, Jesus' mother's cousin. You remember she was past the time of childbirth. So Zechariah 
had, he, you know, he wasn't necessarily like Abraham with faith, believing in yeah, God going to do. He didn't understand what God was trying to tell him. And it, it said that there was no room reason. And I'm going to read this again. Zechariah questioned the entirety of the message based on his own limited understanding and perception. And here's what I said, even bringing from the last series, is if, if God is involved in it, oft, most often you're not going to even be able to comprehend how it's going to get done. That's how I know that God is in the middle of something is when I'm somewhere, I'm positioned somewhere, someplace that I do not belong because I'm questioning the messaging, messaging. And what we're really doing when we do things like Zechariah did here is we're really calling God a liar. I mean, you think about it. If God says this is going to happen, but I don't believe it's going to happen. I'm questioning him. Remember, I told you earlier about my father. It got to a place where my father deserved my doubt. I, my kids in a few ways have deserved to doubt me. God has never not fulfilled that thing according to his will. So why do we doubt him and call him a liar as we would call somebody on earth a liar who has disappointed us and let us down? And then Zechariah forgot that human facts do not hinder God's promises. And saints, that I, I've always told you that, and I'm not going to beat that horse Sunday school students anymore. Zechariah forgot human facts do not uh, hinder God's promises. I cannot even believe God has me leading his people because the fact is that when that journey began, um, I was and am still anyway, a, a street preacher. I'm one of those crazy guys out there on the corner with a sign with a megaphone, like in public preaching Jesus, like out there. I'm one of those guys, one of those crazy guys. Yeah. One of your pastors, I'm not, you know, I'm not pimp suit and pulpits. That's not what I do. I'm one of the crazy guys on the street corner, but I also lead God's people. But I had I had struggles and I'm just sharing this and then we'll go to what do you think in the closing thought here? Because I know I'm not equipped to do that. I can't sing. I can't hoop. This is what I believe, questioning God's sufficiency. I'm going somewhere with it. I don't like really care about like being a part of the good old boys club or, or like networking. And man, a lot, man, most black preachers I know, man, they're monster networkers. They could just do it. I don't have that skill. Nothing about me said that I should be leading his people at this season. And I'm not saying I'm better because I already told you I'm no more special to God than you. My gifts are no more important than you. But what I forgot is human facts do not hinder God's promises. It was because I couldn't do those things that God put me forward because I know that I should even be alive, let alone doing what I'm doing with you right now. I mean, in my flesh, in myself, I'm an idiot. Don't be fooled by the way I, I sound or the way I talk. I mean, God did this. He had to because before he saved me and before he, you know, I was out there drinking drunk. I told you about that. And he, he said, you going to preach the gospel? I read the Bible, but it was just words. It was like any other book. And he opened it to my mind. So I'm saying to you. The fact that I couldn't even comprehend his word meant nothing because he opened my eyes. And I'll, I'm in with this before. So what do you think? Don't let the facts of your situation, circumstance or who you are or what you lack stop you from believing that God can get it done. And don't listen to anybody else that tells you God can't get it done. We're, we're in a, a six part series at our church titled. That's what you say. You with the emphasis on you, what other people say, and what we say about ourselves to hinder what God is trying to do. He can get it done. Are you open to how he's going to get it done though? And we'll talk about that another time. What do you think? Why is it considered punishment for Zachariah not to be able to tell his testimony and share the good news? News. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, this is just part one. Father, I just thank you. Lord, as we go into part two, uh, a lesson two anyway. Father, I just thank you for all the things you've done. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your promise. Lord, I thank you that the facts of what I believe don't hinder what you could do. Father, I just pray over all our viewers right now, whether it be 50 or 500, wherever this is found. Father, I just lift you up. Lord, I just praise your name. Father, I just, uh, Lord, just shout, Lord, in the spirit and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Hit the like and subscribe button.